Hello class and welcome to the final episode of Eddie's Workshop where I take you through the tabletop RPG development process. Um, so I appreciate you guys uh, who have coming in for the past few episodes. Um, uh, I, I, this one's going to be a little short on content um, because I'm going to talk about approvals and what that entails. Um, but then I figured I'd use the rest of the time to talk about uh, any questions you may have that I haven't already covered. Um, so if you're in the chat, uh, go ahead and start dropping questions uh, in the chat, and I'll get to them once I wrap up kind of my, my talk today. Um, it doesn't have to be about tabletop RPG development. If you have questions for me in general, I'm happy to answer those as well. Otherwise, I am just going to babble on for an hour. Um, so feel free to ask me questions so I can give you information you want instead of me just talking about whatever comes to mind. Um, and I do want to say um, before I dive in that uh, this has actually been a really cool experience. Um, this is something that uh, uh, Travis Leg and I talked about doing um, back at Midwinter. Um, and somebody was mulling over a little bit even before then. Um, and I was literally a little nervous about doing this. Um, this was something that I, uh, talking on camera is not something I'm, I'm as comfortable with as I used to be. Um, but uh, it is definitely... Um, been a really enjoyable thing to actually talk through the process and show people, you know, not only uh, different elements of the manuscripts, but also just chatting with people uh, online. So I really have dug this. Um, if there is enough content to do another kind of season of workshop, I may I may consider doing that. Um, so if you have been enjoying this, also uh, let uh, the Onyx Path Twitter account know so we can decide if this is something we'll do more of. Uh, but anyway, enough of that. I want to kind of show um, the, the, the now ubiquitous um, process chart that I've been using for the past uh, few episodes. Um, this is uh, kind of an overview of, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, um, this is an overview of what our development process looks like. Specifically, this is a, a slightly... Um, modified version the one we use at onyx path uh, it's a little uh, trimmed down it's a little uh, simpler than the one we actually use because you don't need to see some of the onyx path specific stuff um uh, but uh, so far I've, I've already gone over um, pitches and outlines um uh, which are basically how a book kind of gets made um and, and what's specifically the kind of book we're going to make and then outlines kind of a, a better plan of how we're going to make that book um that from there, uh, we have the uh, production phase, which is actually you know making the uh, different elements of the book, specifically the the, the manuscript itself. Uh, then you know we have uh, the editing phase. Um, you know, book is edited. We have uh, the art phase. We haven't talked about the last two phases yet, so I want to kind of go over those real quick. Excuse me. Um, the art phase is happening simultaneous to uh, the editing phase. Uh, basically, we reach out to the art director with uh, art notes. And uh, any notes for like icons for like uh, bloodlines, subgroups, what have you. And uh, the art needs the artists need to know to a certain degree what the the context of manuscript is. They don't need to have the final text. So there's no reason why we can't get art going with the pre-edited uh, manuscript. Uh, so usually we'll uh, write up uh, art notes from there um, and. At Onyx Path, at least we have an actual form we fill out. Um, so it's, um, we'll talk with, uh, usually it's Mike Cheney, um, talk to him about uh, what the size of the thing is, how many chapters there are, and he'll let us know here's how many uh, fulls we need, which are full page art, halves, which is half page art, quarters, which is quarter page art, um, and then any kind of cover, uh, if they're uh, splat art, which is basically the um, picture of the iconic character on the two page spread of a character type, like your, your clan, your class, what have you. Um, he'll give us the numbers for all of those, and then the developer will write up uh, notes on each of those art pieces and what needs to be in there. Um, at least at Onyx Path, um, we generally trust the art director to have a better sense of what looks good, but the art director is not as familiar with the material as the developer is. So um, the developer gives a lot of suggestions, but sometimes the art director might change that up um, if he needs a little more action in there, uh, if there's too many you know, of the same looking character over a period of time. Um, he may tweak and modify things. Sometimes I'll talk with the developer about it. Sometimes I'll just make a decision and move on. Um, so it is a kind of a, a collaborative process. We're t t t basically we're trusting the art director to, to know what's best and what's going to look good for that kind of product. 
Uh, from there, it goes on to uh, layout, um, which is where the manuscript and the art are put together into uh, a final book. And you see that um, basically that's where kind of editing and art syncs up. Uh, the final edited manuscript um, goes to layout. Um, the art comes in layout and they kind of all put together. Um, and then we have process called proofing, which I did way back in the very first kind of uh, a zero episode, as it were, kind of the first episode before this was formally Eddie's workshop, where I went through the proofing process where you look at the actual layout and kind of mark up all the things that need to be corrected or changed. Um, and then you have the actual release schedule where you put out the PDF release. Um, we collect any errata we have for the process. Uh, it, it goes, if it's an index, it goes to an indexer. Um, the index handles that. Um, then the final PDF is released. We prep the printer version, uh, goes to the printer. We proof the printer version. And then finally, the print version is released. Um, these are, with the exception of the errata, taking the errata in and actually marking up the uh, layout with it, the developer isn't really involved in that part of the process. So I'm not really going to cover that. Um, uh, again, and the errata really is just functionally another proofing pass. Um, the errata comes in from fans. Uh, the developer goes through and kind of looks at whether this errata is actually valid or not, because sometimes what uh, the community thinks is an error may not be. Um, for example, uh, when we uh, still working on Abrant, we did collect uh, playtest data, which is kind of an early errata phase for the manuscript. Um, and three different people mentioned to me that um, the phrase Papple Bull, B-U-L-L, was incorrect to be a Papple Bill. But that's not true. Actually, papal bulls are a thing. Papal bulls are a thing. Um, when it, the Pope puts a proclamation, it's called a bull. Um, so that's a case of like, it looked like a typo, but in fact, the original version was correct. So the developer has to go through and kind of double check that to make sure that those are actually valid concerns. Mark up the PDF, and it goes back to the layout artist for one last revision on the proofing pass. But that's also usually when we do the uh, page XXs. So, so the, the, the uh, uh, now, very, very long joke of, of oh, you forgot page XX, lol, lol, lol. Um, but the reason why that usually goes very late is because if there is a change in the text that may shift content, so like something that was at the bottom of page 55, if we put an extra paragraph in there, that's now on the top of page 56. So rather than changing all the page references, we just save them for last. And frankly, it's been a long time since we've had a missed page reference in a book. Usually we're pretty good about catching them now, so... Um, we still use XX as kind of our placeholder, uh, more out of tradition than anything else, I think, at this point. But that's the reason why you used to see them before, because it was much harder to visually scan a page and find an XX. Now I could just do a finds on the PDF, just do finds P period at XX, and it'll highlight all of them, and I can just mark them all up. So it's very, very, very simple. Um, hey, uh, thanks for the resub we showed. Appreciate that. Uh, but uh, so I wanted, to, I wanted to go through all of this because you'll see that there's these red dotted boxes at each stage, um, and those are the approval stages. Um, uh, and what's kind of what those are for is there's two different things that are happening there. Um, in general, uh, uh, let's assume for a moment this is a, a Onyx Path completely owned game, um, so a Scion or a Trinity. Um, What's usually happening is the creative director is taking the opportunity to actually weigh in and decide if they're okay or not okay with each stage that, that's proved on. Uh, if we have a licensed partner, like, for example, uh, White Wolf Paradox, uh, or in, actually even in my case, um, when Omics Path technically uh, is licensing Pugmire from me, from Pugsteady, um, so I get an approval pass outside of my usual Onyx Path duties on Pugmire projects. Um, and so uh, the, the license holder is then getting a separate kind of chance to review um, whether the, the product is working in their wheelhouse, whether it's doing what they needed to do, so on and so forth. Um, there, I've been on both sides of the approval desk. Uh, let me start with that. Um, when I worked at CCP, uh, when that was kind of merged with White Wolf, um, there was a time where Onyx Path, Richard left and formed Onyx Path, but I was still working at CCP. And there weren't a lot of people at CCP who truly understood uh, uh, what was going on. Um, so they didn't really, they were busy making a video game, they weren't worried about tabletop role playing games. Um, and so I basically volunteered to kind of act as the liaison between 
uh, Onyx Path Publishing and CCP. Um, so I was the person who would take the information out, would bring it before the key stakeholders at uh, CCP, and we would have discussions about the approval. Um, I was also the person that got consulted by the legal departments um, whenever there were any legal concerns. Not any, we're going to sue someone kind of way, but just you know, let's get these contracts sorted out. Which things do we actually own? Which things do we need to put a trademark on? So I would sit in discussions with them, uh, and, the, and I heard a lot about the legal approval process. Um, and uh, as Pug Steady, now that I have my own IP, um, I have actually talked to several people who have tried, to, not just Onyx Path, who licensed Pugmire from me. Um, so there's a lot of that side of the approval process I'm familiar with. And on the flip side, um, I've worked on a lot of licensed properties. I've worked on Futurama. I've worked on um, a WWE role-playing game. Uh, I've worked on a Firefly game. So I've been on the reverse side where I have to put material up for a license holder to approve. Um, so first I'm going to go through what's happening kind of at each stage of approval, and then I'll talk about what different kinds of things people are looking for in approval. Um, and we keep it to just things that a developer actually has control over because there's going to be certain things that a uh, approval pass may look at that the developer has no control over. Um, so we're not going to worry about that. We're going to worry about things that you can directly put into your manuscript to kind of figure out. Um, uh, uh, so uh, first off, um, the pitch approval. Uh, again, this is mainly so that uh, the license holder or the creative director um, are okay with the book that's going to be made. Um, I talked before back at the pitch episode, um, but yes, uh, basically it's, the pitch is really designed for the approval process. Um, the approve, a pitch makes no sense if there's no approval process. Because re So really all you're doing is saying, here's a short document to sign if the people who are eventually going to make the game or who hold the license for this game are okay with us making this exact product. Um, so it is, this is the most straightforward approval because it's basically just, and I, I have to give you that and go, is this a thing you want? And the approval process goes yes or no, we don't want that. Um, the outline approval, now getting a little further afield, um, that's primarily what we're talking about in regards to um, this outline is going to be uh, what I call author facing. Um, this is eventually going to be a document that we give to freelance writers to eventually make the manuscript. Um, so when the approval people are looking at the outline, they're not necessarily looking at a document that's written for them. They're looking for a document that's written for writers. But it's still a good document for them to weigh in on because we now have to explain this project cold to people who have not been involved in discussions earlier. And it gives both license holder and the um, creative director one last chance to say, okay, is this the way we want to communicate this project to people who aren't us? Um, so the pitch document can be very focused, very tight, because usually there's discussion going on with that. And so we could say, yeah, remember we talked about this, well, we'll put that in there, blah, 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 blah. With the outline, now we have to actually articulate those components. Um, and so that's uh, one of the things that we kind of have to, to tweak and, and work around with. Um, it's... And it sometimes, especially for people who aren't familiar with the approval process, this can be where things start to get a little unusual for them because they are not understanding if this document is necessary for them. So there's going to be things in the document that aren't things they need to weigh in on. Um, uh, for example, I've had a pr people in the approval process question, like, why am I reading the five paragraphs about the style guide? I don't care about that. And they say, yes, but the writers need to have that information. So it's not for you. Um, if there's something in the style guide you have concern about, that's okay, but you can just also skip over it. Um, which parts various people in the proof process skip over, that's something I'll talk about in a minute. But basically, we're now in a stage where not every document, every phase of every document is going to actually be relevant to everyone in the approval. Um, and that gets more obvious when we get to manuscript approval. At this point in time, we have a manuscript that, if there were no approval gate, would be going directly to an editor. So we are as far along as we possibly get before an editor. We want this to be as, as nailed down as we possibly can get it. Um, so when you go to a creative director, when you go to a license holder, this is their first chance to look at what the book is eventually going to be. Um, and this is a chance where if they need to add the material or say we don't want to talk about that or this is going too far, they can weigh in. Um, this becomes now inc incredibly 
uh, what I call idiosyncratic in terms of who's involved and what they want to see. Um, some some people don't care about the mechanics. And they're just going to gloss right over the mechanics. They're just like, I don't care. I don't know how tabletop the game even works. So I'm just going to skip over all this character creation stuff. But they may zoom in on very specific details because they feel like those are important to communicate because it's for their brand, because it's their, well, it's their property, what have you. Um, so it's entirely possible you'll get huge chunks of manuscript with no comments on it and other chunks that are very dense with comments because that's what the approval holder wants to actually dig into. Um, and again, with the outline and the pitch, it's they're so small documents, you can't really see that, but the manuscript, you they start to see, you know, it's like, so you didn't care about these 10,000 words about powers, but you want to spend a lot of time talking about this 500 word section about this area of your world. Um, and that might be a, a thing that happens. Um, so uh, the manuscript approval is usually the part where the most actual detailed oriented conversations are really going to happen uh, in, in, in regards to the approval gates. Um, there's some previous discussion uh, that may happen, but in terms of now we're going to make this thing, a lot of the conversations are probably going to happen at this stage. Um, so it's not uncommon for uh, a manuscript to go through a couple of approval passes. Usually by the pitch and outline stage, it's like, no, we talked about this, that's the book going to make great. Um, at the manuscript stage is where the rubber meets the road, as it were, and you have a better chance of having more discussion and feedback. Um, uh, the art approval stage, um, I, again, this is going to be very kind of dependent on who's involved and what they want to see. Um, uh, some people, like Onyx Path, for example, uh, it pride, they pride themselves on uh, the quality of their art. Um, and so Rich usually has some fairly strong opinions on what the art looks like and how it's going to be okay or not okay. Um, he wants his games to look a certain way, and he wants to make sure that that look is, is gone throughout. Um, some more license holders, like White Wolf, are similar. They have a, an actual... Um, uh, art Bible, as it were, um, uh, where they say this is what all the art in the game used to look like, um, and this is the, the guidelines and standards that art need to conform to for the game lines. Other games um, don't necessarily, or our license holders don't necessarily care that much about the art. Um, they just want to make sure the art is accurate, not necessarily what the aesthetics of it are. Um, and where those lines drawn can get very kind of muddy, uh, and sometimes uh, license holders don't really know that they have opinions on aesthetics until they start seeing art. Um, certainly there's been a couple of license holders I've worked with where it's like, well, we don't care. We just trust you guys. And then when there comes to say, oh, well, actually this character should look like this. This looks kind of cartoony. Is that what you meant? Um, there definitely is a lot of uh, parts where this part in particular can break down. Um, you, well, it, it depends on the project, but usually... I've done these enough that I try to at least have some kind of conversation early on about here's what our general art you can look like, um, put together a, a mood board, which is a term we've stolen from uh, video games where it's like, here's different kinds of images from different artists online that we've found that can give you a sense of what the idea looks like. Um, when I first started working on Pugmire with Rich, uh, we actually, he spent a lot of time just sketching. He spent he made a dozen, two dozen sketches of things that he thought would look good for Pugmire. And from those discussions and sketches and from those discussions, I actually refined and developed some of the uh, world of Pugmire um, because he would say, hey, do dogs have armor on their tails? You know, or how do dogs drink because of their noses? Because he was trying to figure out ways to draw them. We talked a lot about how uh, paws would look and how legs would go. Um, not every game has that kind of ramp up in aesthetics. So sometimes when you're in the middle of a game, um, art comes in, you start making decisions on the fly as an art director or the de developer comes up with a detail and we have to find a way to reflect that visually. And so decisions get made and sometimes the license holder doesn't want that to go that way. Um, so ideally we try to get a few representative pieces of art in front of the uh, license holders early on um, so that we can get their input and feedback on things so before we have to redo like a dozen or two dozen pieces. Um, as a side note, the Kickstarter process has actually been weirdly very good about that because usually we have to get some representative pieces for the Kickstarter. And so it's a good time to also say, hey, are these good? Um, and so we can get this early feedback on those, say, six pieces of Kickstarter art, um, get those going. And then once the Kickstarter is fulfilled, then we can actually go back and get the rest of the art commissions because now we have a better sense of what the license holder is going to be okay with. Uh, and then uh, the layout approval is usually the last stage of a, a license holder approval. Um, they get to see the final book, and this is their last chance to comment on anything involving the book. 
uh, usually they've seen the manuscripts already. Uh, they've seen art already. So really it's just we're putting those two things together. Um, do you have any concerns about where the art is landing, how it looks now on the page? Um, and usually in my experience, the layout approval process is the least onerous. Um, at a point in time, everyone's pretty much had the conversations they're gonna have unless something unusual happens or it's a brand new book that we've never established a style for before. Usually the layout approval is kind of like, yep, that's good, go ahead and move it on. Um, that's, it's usually the least of a road bump, uh, as it were, for the approval process. Um, and there's also the the prints proof, but that's usually um, not for license holders. Um, that's only for a creative director. The creative director obviously wants to make sure that the print version of the books look great, um, so they care about those. Uh, but the license holder usually it's like, okay, this is gonna be a book. You know, I've already proved the layout. That pretty much gives me everything I need to know. Um, I, I think I've had one ever license holder want to have a proof prints review phase. Um, and that was discussed during a contracting. Um, but even uh, for video games, that would be the same thing as like, I want to see the final build. Um, I want to see the final build live. Before. Like, there's a difference between seeing it emulated on your computer and seeing it on the console it's eventually going to be for. That's the equivalent of a, a, pr a print proof. Um, and so that's the only time I have license agreement. I want to see it actually on the device before I finalize it. Um, but they, that's, that's again, very tech-specific. Uh, I have almost never heard of it in the tabletop RPG industry or in books in general. Usually you have a pretty sense of what a book looks like um, and there's discussion about what that final book's going to be. Um, so... Those are the approval stages. Um, and again, like I talked about before, uh, everyone's looking at different things here. Um, I've kind of alluded to them during the steps. Um, but uh, the, the big things is that if you're a creative director, um, as a developer, the things your creative director are going to look at are, is this game fun? And that is surprisingly a question that does not get asked often enough a lot of times. Um, you get really deep in the weeds of here's the world and it's going to look like this and here's how the dice are going to get together and here's how the mechanics are going to work and then it's like okay yeah but it's actually entertaining to play at the table um the career director that's going to be one of the main things they're worried about it's like is this game actually fun to play and that's one of the jobs of the career director is to make sure that those kinds of things are being thought about um uh, 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 as, as uh, Danielle posted in the chat, it's like, yeah, the, but what do you do at the table question? Uh, sometimes th that, that question needs to be asked, and sometimes it's asked late in the process. Um, in general, we've been pretty good about usually trying to figure that out during at least the outline stage. Uh, but again, the career director is going to be asking that question. Um, they're going to be figuring out what that game is going to feel like at the table. Um, another thing the career director is looking at is does this product make sense in the market? Um, that's usually a pitch outline stage question. You know, we don't want to move forward with the game if it's not going to make sense for that particular company's uh, markets or a particular company's sensibilities. But that being said, um, sometimes during the course of the process, that question might shift. For example, when I first started pitching Pugmire, the, it was pitched to be a modified 3.5 D&D game because 5th edition had just been announced when I pitched it. I didn't know what 5th edition was going to look like. I just knew the 4th edition did not allow have a license that allowed me to do the game I wanted, and also 4th edition was not the feel I wanted. So I was taking 3.5 and really stripping it down. I spent like actually a month and a half going through the original uh, SRD and trying to find a version of Pugmire that would fit within that structure. And then 5th edition came out, and a lot of 5th edition design decisions were very similar to ones that I was making with Pugmire. So uh, in the course of production, we had we started to see what the early 5th edition D&D audience was going to look like. And it was distinctly different from the 4th edition audience. So during the course of the game, we had a couple of conversations about, okay, how, like, can, do we need to adjust and modify and change this? And then during the Kickstarter, we found the kinds of people who were back in the Kickstarter talking about it were a little different than I initially anticipated. So again, I kind of had to adjust and tweak. And so having a career director say, okay, but is this the game you want to make? Is this still going on? Luckily, there was never any doubt about Pugmire specifically, but sometimes with other games, there could be like, okay, but is this really the game we originally signed on for? Or more accurately, has things changed in the background? Have our, has our company changed? Has the culture changed? Does this game going to land the same way? Is this game going to land differently? Uh, another example of that uh, for an upcoming game is Trinity Continuum Adventure. Way back when first edition came out, uh, it was set in the 1920s because it was felt that when that game came out at the time, fighting Nazis was extremely cliche. 
And so people didn't really want to, to bother with Nazis. So they set it as far in the fact that Nazis weren't actually a viable protagonist. Nowadays discussion, um, the sense of fighting Nazis is actually a much more relevant cultural touchstone. And so we had a discussion about moving that ahead 30 or 10 years to the 30s to where it, fighting those proto-Nazis actually makes a lot more sense because that is a gameplay thing. We actually do want element because the culture in which this game is being released is now distinctly different than it was in first edition. So these are the kinds of discussions that a creative director is going to have. It is, the, is this game fun? Is this game going to sell for me? And, and ultimately, is this game going to look good? For most creative directors care about that. Not all of them, but at least Onyx Path and the ones I work with also worry about the visual aesthetics. Does the book look nice? Is it too big? Is it too small? Um, a game is too small, looks like it's not worth much. If a game is too big, it could feel ponderous and intimidating. So the physical design of the book and how thick it is are actually really serious considerations how many dice it uses these are all things that feel like they're constrained by the subject matter but in fact can be constrained purely by aesthetics uh so when i worked on v20 i said early on this is going to be a 500 page book it's going to be huge going to be massive but at the time that was what we wanted to do because it was an anniversary edition so it was a big huge beautiful tome that for fans who have loved this property for 20 years and it felt like they had everything in it so that was a specific aesthetic decision of having that big heavy tone um but it was not then be a game that was going to be your first first player's game the idea was that it was going to be for a person's first experience of vampire the masquerade over time that changed and it was like well if i had known differently we may have done v20 differently but the fact of the matter was it was meant to be a big collector's edition book so we wanted it to be big and, and ponderous and, and feel really nice and heavy and and complete tome of knowledge that was very much the design we went for uh, on the license side, uh, as a license developer, the main things uh, you're going to work, you're going to look at are things like, is this property going to enhance or dilute my property? Uh, and that's the big question. If I'm licensing Pugmire out to a video game, and that video game puts out a, a product that I feel like violates the tenets of Pugmire, I'm going to have concerns. I'm going to raise those during the approval stages. Uh, for this is a hypothetical thing, it actually happens, but it's something it, it's something that I have been open about to licensors, is that you know, uh, uh, sexual content is not a thing that we do in Pugmire. Romance is a thing that's possible in Pugmire, and certainly that should be uh, evolved and encouraged. I encourage all different permutations of, of romance in Pugmire, but actual explicit sexual content is something that is not a part of my game. Uh, and so I have to very early on, it's like, well, if you come back and you're, you know, Pardon the pun, if you're trying to throw a dog a bone, I don't want to necessarily see that in Pugmire. And so I, as a soldier, be like, no, I don't want to see this. We need to adjust this product so it's removing that off of what the, where the design's going. Um, the other thing that we had to uh, you think about when you're a license holder is, is this an area that I ultimately want to do myself? Or is this an area that's, I will never get involved in. Um, so, uh, for example, I'm as, as much as I've worked in the video game sphere, uh, I'm not set up to produce a video game. So, if someone came to me about doing a Pugmire video game, uh, I that's going to be a license discussion because I'm just never going to ground to it. I may, I may want to be involved. Uh, certainly, I've written for enough Pugmire or for enough video games, I should say, enough Pugmire video games. I've written for enough video games uh, that I have some opinions on uh, narrative design. Um, so these are things that uh, you know, I may have want to be involved with, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, I'm going to be the person who makes it. Uh, on the flip side, if someone came to me and said, I want to do a Pugmire novel, that's something I may want to write someday. And so it may be a case like, well, I don't necessarily want you to do either a novel at all, or I don't want you to do specific areas of novels, or I want you to do novels in a very constrained format, like say through Canis Minor. Uh, I may have opinions about where I need the property to go. And also um, I'm gonna have a license holder information that the licensee is not gonna be privy to. Like maybe I'm gonna make a, a movie or a TV show or whatever in three or four years. And if someone comes up to me with a different proposal for that, I have to be aware of that. Or they may start, the project may start going into areas that I have other plans for. Um, a good example of this is uh, someone early on in Pugmire approached me about doing Waterdog Port for a, a podcast. And I was keen for it, but I said I need to be involved in that discussion because I knew in the back of my head I eventually was going to be doing a pirate source book. And that was going to touch on Waterdog Port. So I had to make sure that um, 
not necessarily that they're completely accurate because the, the goal is not to make this a lead-in product for Pirates of Pugmire, but rather just to make sure they weren't going in wildly atonal directions. That with someone who saw, who listened to this and then got Pirates of Pugmire and said, this is completely different. I don't want them to turn them off of my future project. So these are all things that a license holders can have in their head. So as a developer, being able to ask questions like, what do you need this project to do? What is causing you uh, frustrations with the current pitch? Um, we talked about this at the pitch outline stage. What are you seeing that's different or has it something changed to what we originally agreed to? These are all questions and comments the developer has control over that they can have discussion with. And sometimes the reality is um, every once in a while, a, a license holder uh, or even a creative director just cools on a project and says, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, it has happened extremely rarely, uh, but certainly there's been a couple of times where I've been on projects that just get spiked. Uh, which is a term actually of, of, of putting a, uh, a proposal or a pitch onto a metal spike for its waste paper. Um, so, but sometimes a project just gets, gets canned, gets, it's, it, it gets canceled. And that's how it is. I worked on the uh, World Arts MMO for five years and ultimately it got canceled because we couldn't make it the way that the company needed to make it. Uh, so these things happen. Um, and these are all things that ideally are preventable through the different approval stages. It is much better to get something canceled at the pitch stage than it is to get it canceled at layout, right? Um, so these, these approval gates are here to try to get people a chance to talk about these things, a chance to um, get ahead of the game and to make sure that this is a product that everyone can agree to. Uh, so, um, and to kind of wrap things up, uh, in regards to that front, uh, I will say that having been on both sides of the table, a good license, or a good approval process is when all parties are willing to give up a little bit. And not every person in the approval process is going to be okay with that. But I have found that if everyone's willing to be a little bit flexible, that usually does make the process a lot easier. Um, so for example, um, I want to mention Futurama project, and to answer a question I saw in the chat, um, no, it's not a Futurama tabletop role-playing game. I worked on a mobile game called Futurama Game of Drones, and one of the advantages in that project was that I got to write alongside um, the original showrunner of, of Game of Drones. We got to get into a site calls with uh, Patrick Verone a couple of times. Uh, it was really, really helpful, and one of the things that was really uh, useful for me to learn about with the approval process uh, was that um, I, uh, someone had written, I it wasn't me, but one of the writers had written a joke uh, about Uranus and uh, the inevitable joke that occurs when you talk about the planet Uranus. Uh, but uh, someone on staff said, actually, in the episode, this episode, blah, 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 there's a, a line here that talked about how all jokes involving Uranus got banned and the, plan got, the planet got renamed as a result and so on and so forth. So we couldn't do the joke as it was written. And so we went to Patrick and it's like, we really love the joke. We think the joke's great. Um, uh, but the, the show itself says this joke is invalid. And Patrick, first of all, didn't remember. It was like, like 2001. It was 16 years ago, he didn't remember. So he would go look it up and say, okay, I remember the episode now. And whatever, the joke's funny. The joke fits within the style of your trauma. I say we keep it. Um, and so the joke stayed, even though it was canonically inaccurate. Um, that was a, an example of a license holder uh, being flexible because the spirit of the property was still really valid, even though it wasn't actually identical. Um, a lot of times when you're doing a tabletop role-playing game, particularly of a licensed property, Adjustments have to be made to make that a gameable experience. Um, I, I like to call this the not everyone can be a Jedi rule. Uh, you're making a Star Wars game, Jedi need to be there, but not everyone can be a Jedi. Um, so you have to find a tabletop role playing experience where other people who aren't Jedi feel like they can have an equivalent experience. And it's a design decision that different companies have handled different ways, but the reality is that a tabletop role-playing game just needs different things. And so you can't do Star Wars exactly the same way. You have to tweak and modify it subtly to that the, the main points of Star Wars are there, but the minor points are still uh, have changed to make that a, a better gameable experience. And who decides what 
details change when that that's where the approval gets come in. Um, each company, each uh, license holder, each stakeholder is going to have different thoughts and different uh, opinions on what needs to go in there, what doesn't need to go in there. Um, when I worked on the WWE Know Your Role game, uh, I, there was a chapter on title histories that got axed because the legal department said, we don't talk about title histories. At that time, that was a decision they made, that they felt that was an important enough thing to, that they needed to cut it. Um, so... There are certain things that are out of your control as a developer, certain things that people are just going to make decisions that don't make sense to you and you have to roll with them. But by having a frank conversation with your approval gate, uh, gate holders as much as you can and say, here's where I was going with it, here's where I'm going, here's what's happening, can I push back on your comment to see what we can do? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the reality is, is that if the creative director or if the license holders say, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. Um, so the... The, the, especially with this property you don't own, the, the approval's out of your hands. You have to adapt. Um, we, in a case like with Pugsteady and Onyx Pass, since I own the property and Onyx Pass licensing it for me, um, I have a little more power in the competition. I can say, well, I really need Punk Mario to do this versus that, but that's a very different and unique situation. Most of the time, it's the approval gate is, it, it's a gate. The, the project does not pass beyond the gate until everyone is okay with it. Um, so that's, that's approvals. Um, and that's sometimes why, uh, when a project's out, you see like it sits in approvals for a while. Sometimes there's a lot of discussion happening. Um, sometimes people are just busy. Uh, um, certainly I've seen a, games go through where it's like, I, I send the thing out and the two hours are like, yeah, it's good. It's like, you could not possibly have read that, but they just are, I don't want to necessarily engage with it. They're, they're, they're comfortable with it. However it is. Um, but sometimes it, 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 there's lots of discussion happening back there, and it could be for a wide variety of reasons. And there are almost always reasons you can't talk about publicly because of the nature of the property, because it involves NDA-related things, it involves other properties that aren't, or other projects that aren't announced yet. There's lots of reasons why um, approvals can take a really long time, why it seems like nothing's happening. In fact, there might be a lot of things happening. Um, but as a developer, making sure you're talking with the people, particularly your creative director, making sure that you're doing what they need to do, um, making sure that you're getting everything you need out of that conversation, making sure that each, at each approval stage you're getting absolutely everything you can is really, really important and critical to make those next approval stages smoother and faster. Uh, so i got about 20 minutes left. I'm going to uh, go through the chat first. Um, Dixie asked me if I am growing a quarantine beard. Um, which uh, Ian points out, quarantine beard is similar to a playoff beard, which is true. Um, but actually, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, this is actually I shaved a couple of days ago, not much, but I did trim it up a little bit. Um, uh, but that being said, uh, because my hair is odd, um, it, it, it's coming out gray, but only in certain areas. So, like, it's gray here, but not here. I don't know why. Uh, so it looks sometimes a little like it's it's patchy, but in fact, it's just gray here but i don't know why it's only on the side of my face i have gray mutton chops i guess that's a thing that's part of my life now um uh you've already talked about uh, the future i'm gonna clear that part up um justin achille actually uh, messaged me on twitter uh, a couple of days ago and asked me um what is the difference between design and development? Which is actually a really good question, and I, I'm glad he asked that because it's not something I've actually talked about yet. Um, uh, so at a fundamental level, design is what happens before development. Um, ideally, what's really happening is you design a game. You figure out if that's game playable, if it's marketable, if it's fun. Then you give it over to a team to develop it. Now, that's in reality a lot muddier, but that's kind of a way to help keep it distinctive. Uh, so um, again, I'll go with a Pugmire because it's it's the one that I had the most kind of direct design experience on. Uh, I did a lot of, I did maybe six months of work before the first pitch. I didn't even have a pitch together until I had the sense of what the game was gonna be. Uh, and part of my design process for that project was making what I called at the time uh, a vertical slice project, but what ended up being the early access book, um, which is I wanted to make a chunk of the game enough that was playable um, to get a sense of, is this actually working at the table on some level? I can make a character. It may not be a full-fledged character, but it's a, it's a playable character. I have the rules there. I have a couple of monsters to fight, um, and I know the basic dice mechanics. And that was a playable game. 
that's all design. Um, that is, is the fact that it became a book called Early Access is actually atypical. Usually that kind of stuff almost never sees another day. It's just a design document to figure out kind of is this thing work well? And it's just going to be um, badly written. It's going to have sticky notes on it. It's going to you know be kind of code to yourself just to see is this thing working? Um, programmers call it junk code or what have you. It's, it's just kind of a, th a thing to see if this game works. Um, a prototype, if you will. Uh, and then um, when I got to the pitch stage, it was, the, okay, here's the game I'm thinking it's going to be. Yes, maybe. Um, and then we talk about that. And then when we get to the outline stage, it's time to make that uh, uh, core design into an actual structure. I'm not designing the whole game at this point. That's what the development process is for. I have designed the core of the game. And I've said, this is what the game is, is going to be. But now we need to figure out how does that scale? How much of this game is actually going to be in this book? And so initial design is I could do all of this stuff and here's what it could look like. And then the start of development is, okay, but how do I fit that into a 256 page book? Um, that book's going to be this big. It's going to have this many words. What What is that going to look like? Uh, and then you give it to a team and you say, cool, the game is designed. It has been created in the sense of the, the structure is there, the skeleton, if you will, the infrastructure, however you want to call it. Now I need you to build on that and make it into a complete product. So that's development. Development is taking that design and expanding on it and developing it into an actual full-fledged product. So in some projects, you're still designing in the course of that. Sometimes you are hiring writers to design chunks of the book. Um, certainly there's been times where it's like, okay, um, I know 80% of what this game could be, but I don't know what spells look like. So just, can you figure that out for me? Here's what it needs to do. Here's the checklist of things that spells need to do. But otherwise, but you design that for me and we'll talk about it. Um, and that kind of happens on uh, International Wrestling Entertainment. Actually, that's a good example. Um, so uh, International Wrestling Entertainment is a source book that's coming out for uh, Trinity Continuum Aberrant. Uh, so this is a weird thing where you have Trinity Continuum Core, that's the core rule system. This is the, the rule system that you use to make a character with and is your core for all the Trinity Continuum games. Then there's the Aberrant book. And the Aberrant book is a book that works with the core book. So it's the, okay, you take the core rules, but add these additional rules to do Aberrant specifically. So it's rules plus rules. Um, and so Trinity Core it gets designed, Aberrant gets designed, but it has to intersect and interface with uh, Trinity Core. Then we have NWE. NWE is a supplement to do professional wrestling inside of Aberrant. And so for supplements, usually it's, okay, you want to add on bits and pieces of the existing design. You know, here's new edges, here's new paths. Um, sometimes you do a new subsystem, but that's pretty unusual. What I wanted to do with NWE when I first pitched it was I wanted to make an entire mini game where you take your aberrant character and distill that down into a wrestling persona that then gets played at the table in a dice game. It does not use the full Trinity system. So basically I was like, here's the core rules. We've added aberrant on that. Now I want to subtract a bunch of different rules to make a completely new game <laughs> out of it. So there's rules plus rules minus rules. Um, so uh, when I pitched the, the document, like the outline, I was like, okay, here's my rough idea for the design of that, that system. Um, and it was about two or three pages of just here's where it's going to go, here's what I'm thinking, here's the bits and pieces. And Matthew and I spent months talking about it, about what, what I actually need to do and how it's going to work. Because during the course of it, um, I asked him to develop the book, and I would just keep the design side of it. So I kept, I, 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 my writing to the book is primarily writing and designing that mini game finally, because I knew where I needed to go. Um, but even then, I, I, some of the things that I thought I was going to do when I actually started putting pen to paper and started thinking about the dice and started actually applying things. Um, I was like, oh, the design's not going entirely the way I thought it would. So again, more discussions with Matthew to say, here's where I think it's going instead. He was fine with it. But then there are other writers writing bits that relate to that. They're like, oh, well, now these are obsolete. So I had to work with them to make sure they were involved with it. Um, and you start to see why designing in the middle of a game is actually unhelpful. You really want to have the core of your design done before you start bringing writers on board, if at all possible. 
Um, one way around that, for example, uh, Matthew Dawkins did on Contagion Chronicle is um, he actually hired the writer to write the key parts first. Um, he uh, hired uh, Megan Fitzgerald to write like the, the splats, the groups, and a couple of the key uh, design elements. He talked with me about what the powers are going to look like at a very high level. Um, so I did what are called the vectors um, and what those could look like and how those could be structured. Um, we talked about those ahead of time. And then we gave those to the writer and then the rest of the team finished up from there. Um, so that was kind of a, let's finish up the design before we move into the development. But that happens in what we normally call a development stage. So these things can move around. They can be different. They can be different uh, stages of things. Sometimes it happens in, in awkward kind of fits and starts. But as a general rule, if you want to know, is this design or is this development? Design is making the system, making the game, and seeing if it works. Development is building on that core infrastructure and building out to be a much larger pro and a complete project. Um, so that was that. Um, uh, I see in the chat that people are happy about uh, Adventure being uh, a Pulp Fiction game about punching Nazis, which, uh, you know, that it's, it's going to be a game about punching Nazis, and I think that's great. But, uh, yeah, also it was not a thing that we could do at that time uh, when it first came out because it was not the same, weren't the same world. Um, so if you have more questions, i got about 15 minutes left. Uh, so, again, feel free to kind of put them in the chat. <clears throat> and I, uh, I will mention uh, that... Um, I've talked about this before uh, in the very kind of the very first episode, but uh, RPG development is a weird title uh, because it doesn't really mean anything, and it's really a whole bunch of different skill sets all crammed together. Uh, and that's something that I definitely, when people talk about making their own tipped up role playing games, it's you're doing the job of what in any other creative design endeavor would probably be several different people. Um, you are a project manager. You are a designer. You are an editor to a certain degree. Uh, you are, if not involved artistically, at least discussing the aesthetics. Uh, you have to think about marketing. Um, there's all these things that you have to kind of wrap together and, and manage a team, usually. You know, you're managing remotely. You know, those are all skills that, that you need to kind of pick up and do. And not everyone can do them equally well. Uh, that's why, at least in Onyx Path, we've been trying to show, here's all the things you need to do. And we've been moving to more and more uh, co-developer systems um, because sometimes not everyone can do everything on it. Um, like, if I'm directly developing a Trinity book, odds are I'm probably going to have Ian on board because he just knows what that world needs to be so much better than I do. Um, and so rather than me trying to learn those extra skills and figure out how that all works, it makes more sense to me just partner with Ian and say, can you do these bits of it? Because I just don't know those parts. Um, uh, similarly, if, if I'm going to be in a project where I'm really worried about how the language is going to land and how the book is going to be read and how it's going to be parsed by people, I'm probably going to make sure Dixie's involved at some level beyond just editing because she's really fantastic at making sure that um, here's what people pull out of it when they read it this way. Here's how this could be seen as problematic. Here's how this could be seen as confusing. Here's how this could be seen as contradictory. Um, being able to to clarify that language to be what it needs to be, but also to be clear and exciting and interesting is definitely something that I want to get somebody else on board. So I always prefer, if I can, to work in a team environment because I'd rather have people do their bit really well then try to have one person say they can do it all and then screw up some key portion of it. Um, and time and again, I've seen a lot of developers, particularly those who uh, grew up in the school of the 80s and 90s where these kind of rock star developers. Developers can do everything and they're, they're responsible for it. They're the creative center and heart of the game. It's like, yes, but having a strong creative vision doesn't mean you can make a good game. And having good team skills doesn't mean you're going to have a good team. Uh, having a good editor doesn't mean much if you're core writing is crap. Having fantastic writing isn't great if no one can read it because it's all jumbled garbage. Um, th these are all different skills. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do these to show that there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's a lot a developer does that we just don't talk about. We just call it, oh, you're an RPG developer. But a lot of times you don't even realize what that means. Um, so uh, uh, I am hoping that these were informative and useful for everybody um definitely my goal with these was not only to have the, a chat with people 
uh, uh, chatting in the in the Skype or in, in the Twitch. Um, doing these live is always kind of fun, but the reality is my goal is primarily to make sure that these got up on VOD and ultimately on YouTube. So that way, down the road, if you're doing a community content project and it's like, okay, I'm working with some other writers in community content, how do I do red lines? Then that's something that you can look back and see that. Or if you're looking, okay, I have to look through this PDF for the 50th time. What kind of things should I look at? Being able to look at the proofing um, should all be really, really helpful. So uh, if, if it has been helpful to you, definitely um, let us know. Uh, I, I appreciate knowing whether it's useful to you or not. Um, again, I'm always trying to find new ways to educate people on what this weird job really is because we just don't have a manual for it. Um, but with that said, um, looks like people are popping out of the chat, so um, I'll wrap this up a little bit early. Uh, thank you all again for hanging out, for, for doing these workshops. I, I appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned before, if you think that there's more stuff I can cover, let me know. Maybe we could get together enough material for a second season. Um, but always, if, you, if otherwise you want me to chat with me, um, you can find me at uh, pugsteady.com, uh, P-U-G-S-T-E-A-D-Y, as you can see at the, the icon over there. Um, uh, also, I'm on from there, you can find my Twitter and Facebook accounts uh, where you can chat with me directly. Uh, and also, um, if, you more, if you're interested in more uh, game design videos, uh, I have been doing a series off and on with um, extra credits. Uh, so if you go to pugsday.com, I have a link to all my extra credit uh, videos. Uh, and also, uh, theonyxpath.com. Listen to the Onyx Pathcast. We also talk about uh, design and behind-the-stage stuff there on a pretty regular basis with, both, with me as well as with uh, Dixie and Matthew. Um, and other than that, uh, thank you and go out and make fantastic games. Talk to you all later.